Board Doctors. Welcome back for those who have been here before, viewed videos, subscribed, what have you. Welcome for the first time for those who haven't. This is the channel Life Board Doctors. It's a free open access medical education channel. Uh, we hope to learn with and from you. Uh, today we'll be talking about adenomyosis. This is one of the subset videos from the abnormal uterine bleeding video. Um, I can link it above. That's an introductory video on abnormal uterine bleeding. Um, and this is part of that differential that we talked about in that video. Palm Cohen is the mnemonic for it. And this would be the A of palm. So P was endometrial polyp. Uh, I can link that video here. And this one is the A, which is adenomyosis. All right. So for adenomyosis, uh, we can talk about kind of just epidemiology initially. So epidemiology and adenomyosis is tough, right? Um, the reason being is the definitive diagnosis is made um, only after, after hysterectomy. So it's really tough to say what the incidence is because obviously not all patients get hysterectomies. Um, and if you can only diagnose this definitively with hysterectomy, um, then you will be missing lots of cases. Um, it's estimated to be around about 20%, but it's been found in anywhere from 40 to 65% of uh, hysterectomy samples that have been carefully examined. So take that for what it is worth. Uh, maybe 20%, maybe more than that, maybe less than that, tough to say. Uh, the majority of cases are between, diagnosed between 30 to 40 years old. So that's when you start kind of thinking about adenomyosis as a cause of abnormal uterine bleeding. Um, otherwise, not a lot for epidemiology here just because of the challenging diagnosis of adenomyosis. So pathogenesis. I know you guys have been eyeing this extremely beautiful, I don't know if it's a Van Gogh or what picture above, but uh, we'll get to this in a minute. Pathogenesis, um, it's endometrial glands that are in the myometrium, right? So endometrial glands, um, there's some stroma there as well that end up in the myometrium. And that's what I tried to draw above here. Um, a picture is worth a thousand words, except in the case of this terrible picture above here. So this is the endometrium and the stroma, right? Stroma, endometrial glands here. And then this is the myometrium. You're supposed to be, you know, calm, smooth muscle or whatever you want. And there's these endometrial glands and stroma within the myometrium. Um, that is abnormal. Um, the reason being is because endometrium, right, it turns over. Um, it gets hypertrophy, then it breaks down. That's what a menses is, is when the endometrium breaks down and sloughs off. So if you're having that happen within the muscle, within the myometrium, you're going to be getting pain and abnormal bleeding because those endometrial glands and stroma should not be there. Um, why does it happen? There's kind of two different proposed mechanisms. The first is that there's an invagination of the endometrium. Invagination of the endometrium um, into the uterine smooth muscle. So invagination of endometrium into uterine smooth muscle. Uter uterine, that looks right. We'll just do smooth muscle, right? So that these come down and invaginate into the myometrium and the myometrium heals over. So then you have uh, endometrial glands and stroma in the myometrium itself. Um, the other theory is, it's kind of this de novo embryologic theory. So you get these Mullerian nests during development and embryology, these Mullerian rests, um, and that those seed the myometrium with endometrial tissue. And that as you get older, that endometrial tissue grows within the myometrium. Okay, um, so that's a pathogenesis. Again, just if you have any questions at all, I mean, the picture in this top right corner, I'm sure will clear everything up just as beautiful as it is. Obviously, sarcasm. But generally speaking, endometrial glands and stroma in the myometrium might happen from vagination, might happen in embryology. All you really need to know. Okay, risk factors for adenomyosis. Uh, we can do that over here. So risk factors for this condition. Um, again, Studying on this is not easy given the challenging diagnosis, um, but about 70 to 80 percent of patients diagnosed are 30 to 40 years old, right? So that age alone is a risk factor. Good multi-parity, so people who have had multiple pregnancies have been found to have increased risk for adenomyosis, um, and then prior surgeries within the endometrium. 
Um, this might make sense for kind of the invagination group um, because there's going to be interruption of this endometrial myometrial border, right? And then some endometrial tissue might be able to get into the myometrium. Good. Let's scroll down um, and we could talk about kind of clinical presentation. Uh, the clinical presentation primarily is abnormal uterine bleeding. Again, you can check out that presentation for additional information on abnormal uterine bleeding in general. Um, but as it relates to adenomyosis, 60% um, of patients present with menorrhagia, right, heavy bleeding. 25% of patients present with dysmenorrhea, pain with menstruation, which if you think about it, those uh, endometrial glands and stroma are sloughing off in the nerve-rich muscle. Um, having pain makes a lot of sense. Then 33% are actually going to be asymptomatic. All right. Um, also, you can get this globular enlargement of the uterus where it feels like as, uh, just say globular uterus, like a 12-week, you know, enlarged pregnant uterus. You can get adenomyomas, which actually feel like nodules, you know, not quite like a fibroid or a lyomyoma, smaller, but adenomyomic nodules. Um, the uterus may be softer and boggier since the myometrial tissue itself has soft boggy endometrium in it. Um, you might have mild uterine tenderness, so tenderness to palpation of the uterus. And then you can get iron deficiency anemia. So as we talked about in the uh, endometrial polyp lecture, which I can link in the top right, um, you'll have those signs of anemia, right? Just those generic things, orthostasis, fatigue, weakness, all that stuff that happens just from chronic anemia. Okay, so primarily these patients will present with menorrhagia or heavy periods. Some will have pain with periods. Some will be asymptomatic on physical exam. You might feel nodules. You might feel globular uterus. It might be soft or boggy or a little tender to palpation. And these patients in general may have some systemic symptoms of anemia. Cool? All right. So diagnosis. Let's do it in black. Okay, so diagnosing adenomyosis. Um, actually, let me. What if I let me take a picture and let's do that. So we're going to copy this. And we're going to bring it over to the main screen here. All right. So the first way to diagnose is actually through um, uh, transvaginal ultrasound. So trans transvaginal ultrasound is one diagnosing modality. Um, unfortunately, the sensitivity is only 72% and the specificity is only 81%. So it's going to miss, you know, about one out of every three. And it might misdiagnose uh, one out of every five or so. Um, MRI. So I guess let's rewind. I should say this. So transvaginal ultrasound is one way to diagnose, but I do want to say first, um, that the gold standard is um, histologic examination after hysterectomy. So histologic exam after hysterectomy is the gold standard. So you cannot completely rule out adenomyosis without uh, hysterectomy and histologic exam. That's tough though, right? Not many people want to get a hysterectomy just to see if they can diagnose adenomyosis. All right. Um, so next would be transvaginal ultrasound. It's the least invasive, right? It's just an ultrasound. There's no radiation or anything like that. Um, now it is transvaginal, so it's uncomfortable for patients. Um, then after that, you know, let's bring this picture over to why not? I wonder if I can just drag. You think I can drag? Dragged. Excellent. So you can bring this over. The next diagnosing modality is actually going to be MRI. So MRI and specifically the T2 weighted sequence. And that's what this is a picture of. So if you compare the two, so this is transvaginal ultrasound, right? And I can circle here. This is uterus, right? And then in here, this would be uterine canal. And this is all endometrium and myometrium. What they're pointing at 
are these hypoechoic areas, which are darker areas hypoechoic areas within the myometrial muscle itself. So these hypoechoic areas, um, they shouldn't have these dark globules. The myometrium should all be this kind of striated hyper or whiter areas, not these hypo or darker nodules. So I can erase this so you can see it better again. Um, on ultrasound, you see these hypoechoic, these dark nodules within what should be the hyperechoic or white lined myometrium. Good. And now, on MRI, we see again, right, this here is uterus, this is the uterine canal. We have all this dark myometrium, and we have these lighter, um, these white specks within the myometrium with this endometrium, um, and that is abnormal. So T2-weighted MRIs, not honestly much better than transvaginal ultrasound. It's 77% sensitive and 89% specific. So our specificity is better, but our sensitivity is really just about the same. Um, it'll still miss a lot. Okay. Um, both modalities, what you're really looking for, um, and I can scroll over here, and we'll just do it in green. So what you're looking through for in both modalities, um, I kind of talked about them in regards to the pictures, but we can explicitly spell it out. Um, asymmetric thickening, of the myometrium, which makes sense because you have endometrium growing and hypertrophying inside of it. Um, you're also looking for uh, myometrial cysts, which we kind of talked about those dark areas on ultrasound. Um, loss of clear endometrial myometrial border. So I'll just do endomyo border loss because you're having mixing of the two tissues, um, and then increased myometrial heterogeny, where the myometrium should all look the same, um, but with endometrial tissue in it, it's gonna be heterogeneous. Good, so then treatment will be our last leg of the race here. So how do you treat adenomyosis? So definitive treatment, just like definitive diagnosis, is, you guessed it, hysterectomy. So the only way to you know, ensure that adenomyosis is not going to cause any issues at all is with a hysterectomy. It's the only definitive treatment. All right. Um, you can try to treat the symptoms um, with progestins. And what that is doing, well, I'll put the other ones here too. A GNRH analogs or aromatase inhibitors. Aromatase inhibitors. This is going to be the symbol for inhibitors. Um, these will assist with, you know, the myometrial hypertrophy and sloth thing that can cause the pain and bleeding. Um, some people found success. Some haven't found success. It's probably worth trialing, um, but it might not be helpful. Um, and then if you don't want hysterectomy, but you've tried some of these medications, they've been unhelpful, you can try more conservative surgical approaches with like uh, endometrial ablation, myometrial electrocoagulation, or even you can try excision. Um, but these, again, are all of limited value because really the only definitive treatment is hysterectomy. Um, if you get a question, um, levonor gestural containing IUDs of all possible medications, um, have been found to be the most effective. So, um, before you go to hysterectomy or off some of these other conservative surgical approaches, levonor gestural, uh, IUD is probably worth attempting. All right, so we talked about the treatment, we talked about the diagnosis, gold standard being hysterectomy, least invasive being NMRI or transvaginal ultrasound, the clinical presentation, uh, risk factors, pathogenesis, and ad epidemiology. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, if you have any questions, concerns, comments, please leave them below. We'll do our best to answer and uh, respond to each and every one. Uh, feel free to subscribe if you're looking for more videos. Check out the abnormal uterine bleeding endometrial polyp videos. Um, and you all have a good afternoon or whatever time of day it is by you.